Good morning, 80s TV ladies. I'm Susan Lambert Haddam. And I'm Sharon Johnson. 80s TV ladies is our podcast where we get to talk about female driven television shows from the 1980s. Today, we're diving into the last couple of seasons of Remington Steel. We have a special guest today who worked on some of the final episodes of the show. And if you don't know by now, Remington Steel starred Stephanie Zimbalist, Pierce Brosnan, and Doris Roberts. It ran from 1982 to 1987 on NBC. And I know today we're going to be talking about both seasons four and five, but all my questions are about season five. I don't know that I have any questions about season four, but still looking forward as always to talk about it. But we have a special guest today who worked on season five. Is that why it's the one where you have all the questions? Well, that and because season five is infuriating, confusing, and just plain weird. It may have suffered some season five. The show was canceled and then it wasn't blues. It may have. Before we get started with season four, just to recap, at the end of season three, Remington Steel takes off because of immigration issues, state license issues, and Laura Holt has said things were easier without him. So he disappears to the UK. And then in season four, we pick up with Laura and Mildred showing up in the UK to find him, and they do in the first two episodes. Then they all reconcile, and Laura spills the beans to Mildred on the Remington Seal secret truth. So Mildred now knows that the man she knew as Remington Steel is not Remington Steel. By the end of season four, Laura and Steel have a fake marriage to keep him in the country. A lot of the fans were both excited and unexcited by that, but it was the end of it was the end of the series. At that point then the show is canceled and they think it's over. Season four, just to, to concentrate a little bit on stuff that I really found a challenge in season four, is some some of the episodes felt like, oh, oh here's the wrestling episode, right? You know, um, but also Laura Holt really is, and, and Stephanie Zimbalist is doing a beautiful job, but she, Laura Holt keeps sort of having to insert herself and assert herself into her own show <laughs> is what it felt like to me, that it was a lot of the, the Pierce Brosnan show Again, hard to fault the appeal of him, but uh, it becomes the struggle of the show. The struggle of the show becomes not them working together, but him dealing with his immigration issues and him struggling to kind of win her over and him doing this and then Laura being mad at him for it. (laughs) And then Laura basically going, no, but it's my agency, you know, and it's my this. And so it felt more like she was sort of always on the defensive in, in season four a lot. Um, even though it started, I think, pretty well when she shows up and is like, OK, I, I'm, I'm coming to get you because you're an idiot for running away. I wonder if, to what degree some of that had to do with the fact that television and certainly Remington Steel is more episodic at that time. And they with that, they have a tendency to write and rewrite certain beats of the relationship where because they because I think from research, they know that most people don't watch every episode. So for those of us that do watch every episode, it does become repetitive. You're thinking, didn't they resolve that already? But okay, we'll go, we'll move on. This happened in the 80s a lot because Mm -hmm. if you missed an episode, you missed it till the summer or or a rerun. And so they didn't do a lot of tracking relationships so carefully as you would kind of have to do now. Now it is about watching, you know, one, then two, then three, then four, then five, and you just consume them all almost like a miniseries. And I'm also not trying to to uh, give the writers too hard a time because writing that many episodes of television every season is really hard under the best of circumstances. And I, it's easy. It was probably easy, if you will, for them to fall in the pattern of, okay, we've, we, we're going to write about this conflict, whatever it is, instead of trying to be a little bit more, for lack of a better word, creative in the way that they dealt with the, the situation, the circumstances between them. Maybe they felt like they'd kind of, I don't know, There's there could be a lot of reasons for it. I think it was one of the shows that was kind of inventing how to do that mm-hmm. somewhat for the first time on television. True. A lot of people, I think, that would then do a Will They, Won't They, a Jim and Pam or a thing really had had those forerunners they stood on the shoulders of giants <laughs> like Remington Steel exactly 
<laughs> Season four, I actually liked the first couple episodes of, of it, London because mm-hmm. I liked it when they went on location. But also, there's an episode, Forge Steel, episode five, where Remington suffers a memory loss and it turns out apparently he, uh, he lost the agency in a poker game. And I just thought that was actually very clever. It, you know, it... it, it uh, comes a case and I thought it was a pretty clever case I loved when Louis Anderson came on and guest starred I thought he was really just adorable and that was for uh, Steel Spawning episode 12 Um, they had to chase down some missing you know Russian caviar as you do for the uh, American caviar czar which was Louis Anderson's father. Like he had made some deal and he didn't want his daddy to find out because he was like the son that was always messing up. And then I also, another episode that stood out for me was Suburban Steel episode 13, kind of in the in the dead middle of the season. And a dead man shows up in Laura's sister's kitchen. Laura and Remington have to take care of Laura's nieces and nephews. And I think there are direct nods in that episode to Scarecrow and Mrs. King because Laura's sister's car is basically the same station wagon as Mrs. King drove. One of the ones that stand out for me that season is Coffee, Tea, or Steel, which is set on a luxury airline. And to be honest, I think it it stood out for me more because of the depiction of air travel as being this potentially this this luxurious experience where you have stewardesses as they call them at the time walking around with trays of drinks and all the space up in the 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 so first class or wherever this these people were sitting and you know chairs and i it i had frankly never experienced that and it certainly isn't the case these days that you would see something like that on a plane so yes it felt like a cruise ship yes exactly yeah, I like that uh, episode because also in that episode is, you know, again, Laura goes undercover as an airline stewardess and is and is treated poorly because of it uh, as a woman. Um, also, Terry O'Quinn guest stars on that from That's Lost. Right. So at the end of season four, the series is canceled. Looks like Pierce Brosnan is going to is going to be cast as, as James Bond. And Stephanie Zimbalist actually is cast opposite Peter Weller in RoboCop. But summer repeats happen, Remington Steel ratings go up, and they reboot the show, and they call everybody, Get, we need our, everybody back, and they had shut everything down. So they call everybody back, Stephanie doesn't get to do RoboCop, Pierce Brosnan has to wait to do James Bond, he does that crazy People magazine uh, cover where he's like, I hate them. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and we come back for basically three TV movies sort of six episodes or three TV movies. We're still not sure. They have a bad honeymoon in Mexico meets romancing the stone kind of episodes. They introduce a romantic rival for Remington Steel to try and make a love triangle happen. Uh, Jack Scalia. Uh, We'll talk about him in a minute. And it's still all about the immigration. So Remington goes back to LA and then has to go back to London and then finds out he inherited a castle with a lot of debt and then suddenly we're in Scotland and then suddenly we're wrapping up the show but at least they bring Daniel Chalmers back Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. which I thought was quite lovely and then they kind of wrap up Remington Laura pretty well it's kind of nice and also it's very clear that season five is about him it's really not about Laura it's all about him and the season I mean the series is really tipped from being initially about her to being about them and now it's all about him and his the everything that's going on is revolves around him and she's just sort of there well and then and then they introduce a guy character and mildred has nothing to do but even what they do with the guy character is first he starts out as one thing and then suddenly he's something else and then he's suddenly something else again and it's very confusing and don't really care because they're not at all consistent with what or who he's supposed to be, which I just found a waste of time at the end of the day, as much as I like Jack Scalia from that time. So, you know. Yes. But you know who could answer maybe some of these questions? Not all of them. And he's not responsible for any of the writing <laughs> of this season or any of the conceptual stuff. But I want to introduce our guest, Jerem Schwartz who worked on some of the final episodes of Remington Steel. We've known each other for years, he and I, since he worked with my husband Richard Haddam on an incredible miniseries called The Lost Room in 2006, starring Peter Krause, Juliana Margulies, Dennis Christopher, Peter Jacobson, and Elle Fanning. It is a beautiful, underrated, not many people know about it miniseries that everyone should see, The Lost Room. Jerem is an assistant director and production manager with over 100 credits that include E.T., The Extraterrestrial, The Blues Brothers, 
and The Walking Dead. He has filmed on locations throughout the U.S. and Europe. Jerem left the glamour of 16-hour workdays for the comparative sanity of the life of an analyst at the California Film Commission. He is also an occasional lecturer and producer, director, lyricist for seven seasons of the Pasadena Follies. So welcome to the show, Jerem. How are you? Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, I'm so excited to have you on. Jerem, tell us a little bit more about yourself. I mean, we, of course, we have your bio, but how did you get into movies and television in the first place? I took a class in college about uh, movies. I went to a college in England called Sussex University. Ooh. And uh, the, the assignment was to write a screenplay. And so I did that. And they said, okay, now go produce it. It's like, humana, humana, humana. And so we built our own lights and we took our 16 millimeter film camera and pushed it three stops. So the, uh, I mean, we just invented it with some guys from school and we had little green screen, little things, and it was terrible, but that was fun. And when I graduated, I came to America and got into the Universal Studios mailroom. And there I started delivering mail to people whose names are now on the buildings, the Alfred Hitchcocks and the Verna Fields and the people like that, the Lee Wasserman. Wow. And... Um, from that, I found out about a thing called the assistant director's training program. And I went down to USC one morning and took the test and I did not get in. And then the next year I went down to USC and got in and the rest is history. I've done that for years and years and years and years. That's amazing. That's through the director's guild. Through the director's guild. Yes. And they still have that program. Yes. They do. Okay. All right. Let's just, you know, cut to the chase of how you ended up on uh, season five of Remington Steel. You know, the life as an assistant director. When I started, if you worked at Universal Studios, they would put you on show after show after show, and you'd just stay at the studio. But uh, Sharon Gless and I presided over the very end of the studio system. I think she was actually the last contract player in Hollywood. She was. I just read that. For both of us, it was the end of the studio system, which meant that uh, once I was through the training program, I had to find my own work. And that meant going from place to place, studio to studio, independent to independent, depending on who liked you, who didn't like you. Uh, and eventually over 40 years, it became who died and didn't die. But (laughs) (laughs) so from time to time, I would find myself working at CBS Radford on shows. And, uh, uh, what was different then is that the people who hired the assistant director in television were basically the producers and the, the, uh, oh, I can't think of the guy. Oh, Abby Singer was there at that time. Oh, okay. Is that a name that? It means is anything to it you guys? Is, it is familiar to me. He was the Abbey Singer is the man after whom the shot the Abbey Singer was named. May I Yes, tell please you about explain that? the Abbey Singer shot. This is something as an assistant director you learned very quickly you had to announce when you're on the next to last shot of the day. We're on the Abbey Singer. Ah. And the reason for that was back in when I knew Abbey, he was in his eighties, seventies or eighties. Way back in the day, probably the 50s or 60s, he was an assistant director and he was famous for saying, okay, this is the last shot. Okay, this is the last shot. He never actually got the last shot correct. (laughs) So the next to the last shot is historically the Abbey Singer. So when you know that you have two shots left, you make the announcement to the crew. It is crazy because I guess I assumed that Abbey Singer was an actual person, but I didn't never actually knew that anybody knew Abbey Singer. (laughs) He was a total sweetie pie. Oh, that's great. Uh, there's actually one other old soul that I'd like to do a commercial for because his name is largely forgotten at this point, And that is Wally Worsley Jr. And when I was a trainee, when I was a young pup at Universal, he was an old dog there. He was the, and I, I worked with him. I knew him when I was in the mailroom. And then later I worked with him uh, on E.T. He was the production manager on E.T. the Extraterrestrial. He had been the prop man on Wizard of Oz. Come on. He and his dad, Wally Worsley Sr., had been the director of the original Lon Chaney uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Wow. So. That is pretty amazing. So you you started when like old Hollywood was still around, but the end, the end of it, the end of the studio system. Yeah. Like, like you said, and uh, Sharon Glass talks about that in her book. I, I did have a camera assistant say to me on a, on a movie, he said, are you the same Jerem Swartz that was working in the 70s? <laughs> and it's like, okay, I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> I think most people like me are familiar with the studio system as it applied to actors and actresses, but not as much to the production crew that that was something similar in that regard. So that's really interesting that that was also part of the system. 
And really, when I started, everybody was everybody looked like they were in their 50s and 60s and they were all white guys and they all smoked and coffee at craft service cost a nickel or a dime or something. You had, you to, had to pay for coffee at craft service? You had to pay service? for coffee at craft service. And it was very crude. It was very crude. Um, so you asked me how I got onto Remington Steel. Remington Steel. And it was really just one of those calls. I've worked, uh, I guess, was Derek Cavanaugh on it? No, I don't think so. It was just one of the guys at CBS called me and... Uh, Sure. You know, I went in and I met the director, who's a guy named Chris Hip- Christopher Hibbler, who came from a uh, a line that was well regarded at Disney in particular. His dad was, oh, he had a cool first name. Do you remember? Oh, no. Something. I don't remember anything at Disney. Okay. <laughs> so I had worked, actually, I'd worked with Chris. So it's possible he put my name in at some point. On a Disney movie, I'd been a second assistant director on something called Hot Lead and Cold Feet. Yeah, I saw that title. With Jim Dale. Okay, yeah, yeah. And, you know, it was kind of an old-timey Disney kids movie. It was a Western. And um, the guy who was the head of the studio was Ron, somebody who had been Walt Disney's son-in-law. And they still remembered Walt. And Chris Hibbler, he told me stories about how he had had to work with Walt, teaching him how to sign his name the way it looks on the TV show. Wow. Oh, my God. Christopher had directed a promo at Disneyland and they had all kinds of ways and, and complicated routines that you had to go through. And there was a giant shot of things happening and things happening and people doing things and dancers. And they were screening it for Walt. And Walt said, what's that little triangle of grass there? That isn't green. What's wrong with that? So he was relating how extraordinary uh, attention to detail Walt Disney had. And it's like there was, was still at a time, and I can't remember what year it is, probably 77, 78, that, you know, this was still a name that was spoken with reverence. For you sure. Know, you did I mean, not make a joke about, about Walt being in a, you know, cooling chamber somewhere. Somebody said it while I was there. This would have been 77, 78. Walt who? No That somebody way. actually said, you know, that's not the way Walt would have said it, done it or done it. And somebody said, Walt who? And it's like, everybody's, everybody went nuts. Yeah, no. Now, I think you'd get in trouble for doing that now. So when you joined um, the crew of Remington Steel, I would imagine that the the crew was maybe half folks that had worked on the show before. To what degree were there people who had worked on the show before it was canceled? And they were all new to me. Okay. And I mean, it wasn't clear about anything. I can't. Uh, here's the thing that I remember about it. Mm-hmm. First, I get to go to Ireland. Well, I have my wife and i have my new baby kate is six months old oh my god kate was six so what i'd like to do i ask them hold on hold on i just have to picture that for a minute because i know kate okay go (laughs) what i'd like to do is i'd like to take the first class ticket that you give me as an assistant director as a member of the guild and change it into two you know steerage tickets you know there we were with this little six-month-old baby and she'd already been on location when she was six weeks old we went to texas to do a movie uh, Adam, the, the sequel to the movie Adam. Oh, okay. And yeah. in fact, she has an appearance in TV Guide being held by Joe Beth Will- Williams in the ad art. Oh, that's so funny. Because they'd had a little baby there. So she was there and she was. So this was her second location. And uh, <laughs> so what I remember was the excitement of going someplace fantastic. And we hadn't been to Dublin before. I had been as a student, but Debbie and obviously Kate had not. Um, But we started off filming in town. And the only part of the filming that I remember is that we did a car chase and it was in the little alleys behind in Pasadena. We were not we were not centered in Pasadena, but this was, you know, before Pasadena really happened. Uh, We had we were living in Altadena at the time, so we were very familiar with the Pasadena and the little alleys between union and oh, colorado okay all right all right i okay. know what you're talking about and we had like a london cab and a car that we were going to double over oh, there that's so and funny. we did some some chase stuff here which we later did there all right i'm going back and looking at that the that that last episode i know what you're i know what chase you're talking about okay good i don't <laughs> <laughs> the other thing i remember is once we got to shooting is that it was clear that there was a cloud remember pig pen in yes mm-hmm. there was a cloud over uh the name of the star Pierce Brosnan Pierce Brosnan's head. And that was all around James Bond. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. that he was just perpetually in a bad mood because he would never, 
ever get to play James Bond now. It that, that looked was like clearly that, at the time. that that was never ever going to happen. I mean, that's what it looked like, right. for sure. It looked like that 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 ship had sailed in some ways. Right. So I think that, and I th- and I took that as a great life lesson. You know, the great life lesson is if you're Pierce Brosnan and they say you can't be James Bond, that it doesn't mean you're not ever ever going to do James Bond. It just means you're not going to do James Bond this time. And I, I've I've referred to that in my life actually. So were you aware of all of the the drama around Pierce Brosnan not getting to play James Bond at the end of season four before you started working on the show, or was that something you learned when you got there? No, I mean I might I might have might have known about it. I didn't care. You know, he was he was professional. He was fine. Stephanie, I liked. Uh, we met her dad at one point. He came. Was well, he in my episode? He's he in he's in there. Your episodes, okay. yeah. I remember at that point doing some research and finding about his father. Yes, the violinist. And putting some bricks yeah. there. I mean, that was very impressive. I mean, that was probably the most impressive uh, celebrity aspect of it for me was you know the what was it the violinist to the to the czar right yeah yeah. And not bad for a nice Jewish boy, right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I will say this. The performances are not lackluster. Correct. They are working really hard. So I'm going to give some, like, I, I, it, it was clear to everybody that he was really bummed that he lost. I mean, and who wouldn't be? It looks like you just lost playing James Bond, a role that, quite honestly, you were kind of built to play and thought you were going to get to play. And then you lose it because they want to just take a slight advantage of your contract. <laughs> well, and I'm sure that helped them, right? That the notoriety around, oh, he could play. His value went up to the to the show people. And we surmise that that's exactly why it was brought back because it was canceled. And then literally at the last minute when it became apparent he was going to be cast as James Bond, they said, oh, no, well, we need to do this. We need to do more of this. Because so. every, everybody got excited about watching Remington Steel. Like, they're like, oh, the, the new James Bond. So we have questions. So many questions. So many questions. Were you part of the castle? Was there a castle where no. you were? We were you filming were Dublin for London. We brought a red bus up, a red double-decker bus up from England to Dublin. They don't belong in, in Ireland. Oh, that's so funny. Okay, so I just assumed you were f- filming Dublin for Scotland. So you were on- <laughs> How stupid is that? <laughs> <laughs> they had a great studio there, by the way. A very old studio, way out in the boonies. You can look it up and find out the name. I can't think of it now. It's still there. But I remember we were filming a uh, mm-hmm. police squad room there. And there was, in every squad room you go to, there's like pigeonholes filled with papers and stuff and i happened to look at it and it was time cards from guys working at the studios in the 50s and 60s i mean it was just you know it's just random paper that happened to be around that the art department had access to and jammed them in and jammed them in and jammed them in oh ardmore studios yes and memorably memorably i had a production meeting to lead at ardmore and they gave me a rental car and i was like 45 minutes late because i got totally lost in the backwoods of driving around it was before satellites, of course. It was all real time, real life stuff. There's no cell phones. There's no, you know, there's no video. You're filming on film. Even for a long time, I'm not sure. I'm not sure when, uh, what's that? Reflex cameras came in. I remember when I started as a trainee that not even the camera operator could see exactly what image was going on to the film. He had to rack over. Right. Right. It's like you had to look through here and then kind of assume what was going to be there. Wow. Now, you know, any idiot on the set can see exactly, you know, on his iPhone, yes. sometimes they broadcast. Right. Yeah. Uh, can, can see exactly what the shot is. But then even the operator couldn't see. Wow. All right. So you were on like four and five then. Or you were. You no, were I think it would three, have been one and two, and three and four, five and six. Right? So you were on three and four. Yeah. So you were on three and four. So I, in, I accept that. Okay. I'm going to, no yes. castle. I mean, no castle. Right. But I think when we were watching it, your name came up on four or five. It would have been four. It would have been, I, I mean, know, it, it came if, up on five if, or six. It came up on one of the ones. Okay. Maybe somebody owes me money then. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. So no castle, but I am glad you got to meet Efren Zimlis Jr. He's wonderful in the show. And I, re- and I have favorable feelings for Jack Scalia too. That was a nice guy. Well, that's good that he was a nice guy. Yeah. It was the wrong it was the wrong show and the wrong part. 
I think for him. Well, it would have been if they had been consistent with what who this he character was, is supposed to be. They changed what he was yeah. every episode. And there were only six episodes or three hours, and but he's he's this, and it it, it was so confusing. He does a fine job. Right. It's not him. He's got he's got a great career. He's uh, w- was totally the hunk of the eighties. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the hunks of the eighties, and is still working and worked a lot. Did a lot of yeah, cool it stuff. Was, it was the writing and was an that actual let it down. and you yeah. know major league baseball player. And I also think that in some ways they were like, okay, well, we're not going to have Pierce, but maybe we'll get Stephanie and a new guy. Like for a minute, it feels like that's what they're trying to do. Oh, I hadn't thought about it from that standpoint. In that season five is like, oh, okay, so we, you know, he had to come back for season five. He's not going to stay. Maybe we can carry this show through. That's what it feels like. And that may have been Michael Gleason. That may have been somebody at the studio. Which would have made sense if, on some level, if the show weren't called Remington Steel. Because how do you continue the show without Remington Steel? You can't put another guy and say, this is now this Remington is now Steel. Remington Steel. It's the spinoff, right? Your job as the first assistant director is just to keep things rolling. My job as the first assistant director is to prep the show within an eyelash of its being. And to take the script, break it down, figure out how long everything's going to take to film, put the strips in order. We still had uh, cardboard strips. Oh, the, then. oh, wood strips. Okay. So cardboard can strips. Explain, wooden. Can you explain this uh, to our listeners? This is a technology that was invented, according to lore, by Charlie Chaplin and his secretary. And that was they would take strips of emulsion and write on it with a grease pencil what the, what the scene was. And emulsion is film strips. Film strips, exposed film strips. So it's like not a, not reactive and pin it on a bulletin board. And evidently this woman came up with the idea of giving each actor a number, Charlie Chaplin being number one. And that's where number one on the call sheet comes from, from that moment. Mm-hmm. Nice. And having a list of the different characters, not the actors, but the characters and numbers that go down. And every time a character number one is in the scene, you put a one there. And every time number two is in the scene, you put a two a little bit lower. And so you can see by this array on your cork board where one works. And for example, you don't want Charlie waiting around. So you don't have a scene with one at the beginning of the day and one at the end of the day. So it's a graphic way of looking at the information. And that became, by the time you get into the 30s, you have the technology that I was brought up on which is cardboard strips of different colors, daytime, nighttime, interior, exterior. There's a whole, uh, actually each studio had its own code coding system. of that. Yes. Well, I mean, that's how I learned in film school, 19 uh, mid eighties. So, well, that's how it was. That's how we did it for years. And for years, even after we had computers, I still kept a board that I felt that I was able to, and to this day, I will tell you that my boards were five to 7% better because there was a tactile aspect to moving the strips around to get the correct schedule that you don't get when you're dragging and dropping on a computer. Well, that, just to have the visualization of it in front of you, for me, I could see that being better for me. But what you can't do on a computer is you can't get the whole movie in front of you. Yeah, that's what that, I think that's what I mean, to see the whole picture of what's happening. And to have to walk to the end of the movie and pick strips and bring mm-hmm. them to the front of the movie. Yes, uh, yes. So it, it is different. And I, I remember... Some big movies we worked on had multiple boards, had boards that, you know, stretched run. And and I worked with a director who said that the, and what would happen is every time you, you have a list of strips that are going to be your day's work followed by a black strip. It says, okay, everything before that is this day, Thursday, day seven, right? And there was a director that I worked with who said that the act of putting the strips that you've shot behind the header board as the header board moves down is better than <laughs> <laughs> we still do the board exactly the same way. Uh, movie magic is really kind of the go-to technology. Other people have other people have tried to come up with things. It really is the standard. It's a very effective way of manipulating uh, information, being able to print out vast amounts of incorrect information very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> we heard that. By the time I got to Riptide, we had gotten it down to the point where. I would finish prep. This is the night before the production meeting at seven o'clock. I would uh, finish at Cannell's office, which is still at high. The office isn't there. The building is there. uh, uh, La Brea and Hollywood Boulevard. Yes. Drive down to Barbara's place on Santa Monica and drop it off to them. And they would work all night and 
generate the and generate the, the shooting schedule the shooting for schedule. the production meeting. I'm sorry that Rich isn't here to talk about Riptide. I think he wants to do a whole podcast on Riptide. That I'll leave to you and him. You also worked on a lot of cool 70s shows. Emergency, one of the first shows you worked on. It was literally the first show I worked on. I worked so much, so many hours on that, that I sometimes slept in the fireman bed on the set. Oh, that's so sweet. I was Ra- Randolph, Mantooth, and Kevin. <laughs> Ty. 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 Yeah. All right, should we say that again? Kevin, Kevin, Kevin Ty. Kevin Ty. Ran, Randolph Mantooth and Kevin Ty. They were so adorable. They were saving lives all over town. Julie London. Julie London. Uh, who is the band leader that... Uh, that I don't know. With white hair. No, no, he was also in the show. Oh, but I don't know. Uh, and Robert Fuller. Okay. Randy Mantooth, it was so funny. He was like, he was like this idol, right? He, he was, was like this he teen... He was the this, sexy one. Yeah. Nice guys. They were really nice. And Kevin was more of an intellectual. So I, I had a nice rapport with him. And he did a lot of movies for, like, he was in Six Man Out. Oh, he's, for, he's done a ton Out. of stuff. No, no, he's, really. Uh, what's the name of that uh, writer-director that uh, did a bunch of cool stuff with Kevin Ty? Nine Men Out. Who did that? Oh, uh, Sales. John Sales. John Sales. So he did a lot of John Sales movies. Yeah, that's right. I mean, he's just done a lot of movies, but I didn't know that he was like, I guess he is one of his go-to guys. Sure. So the th- thing I remember about Randy Van Tooth, we were shooting, so, we were always shooting in really hot places. And it was like, you'd get the script. I remember it. It's like, oh yeah, we got a car on the roof, this one. And you know, what other Side horrible, building, whatever yeah. horrible things are yeah. happening. But I remember we were, sh- we were shooting way out by Magic Mountain. And those days it took a long time to get to Magic Mountain. Right. And and it was a million degrees. And he invited me into his trailer and he offered me a an ice cold Werner's diet ginger ale. And I'd never had it before. And that was like his thing that he loved. And he was very generous in sharing that with me. Was Bobby Troop the Bobby person Troop. You're... Thank you. Yes. Oh, yes. He was a big okay. deal band leader. He was a big, was big, big deal. Big, big deal. Yeah. And Julie London was a great singer. Well, Emergency was like the first time I was like, oh, that's what Los Angeles looks like. Because it was set in L.A. Um, but you also worked on Barnaby Jones and Columbo. Worked with Peter Falk, Buddy Epson. Uh, B- Buddy Epson was adorable. He would occasionally fall asleep during takes. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and about 30 years later, I went to my bank in Altadena. It was the Bank of America up on Lake Avenue. And there was a security guard there, a much older guy with big mutton chop, white mustache. And he said to me, did you work on Barnaby Jones? I said. Yeah, I worked on Barnaby Jones. He said, I remember Barnaby Jones trying to teach you to tap dance. And swear to God, it was true. He was he was a stand-in on the show. Oh, and my so, God. Wow. So that came back to haunt me many, many years later. Adam wouldn't say haunt. I think you should you should put it on a plaque somewhere that Barnaby Jones taught you to tap dance. No, he didn't. He wasn't successful. No, no. <laughs> he tried to as, the, as a security guard said. But how did that come about that he oh, wanted to? Oh, of course. To... I mean, of course, I was a young schmuck. You know, yeah. can you teach me to tap dance or something? You know, I don't remember what it was, but it was like, of course, I want to learn to tap dance from the original <laughs> Tin Man. Yes. From the Tin Man. The Tin Man. <laughs> We're going to take a little break. We're going to come back. We're going to ask uh, some more questions of Jerem and his life in the 80s on television and movies. Life in the 80s. <laughs> All right, Sharon, welcome back. Welcome back, Jerem. <laughs> We are, see, we're getting goofy over here. We're getting a little bit silly. Well, because we're having such a great conversation. It's been so fascinating. All right. So again, not an 80s TV uh, lady at all, um, but we have to talk about the Blues Brothers. That was your first movie as a first assistant? Well, so what happened was I had started at Universal in the mailroom. And then when it came time, once I got into the training program, I was kind of seamlessly integrated into emergency there. That was a show there. So... I'm still working at the studio. Which clearly I'm the only one that loved, but okay. Melissa loved it too. Awesome. I didn't see it, unfortunately. Yes, Julie London. I worked on a couple of features there. Start The first one was Swashbuckler. Ooh. Ever, anybody ever hear of that? No. That was a pirate movie before pirate movies were successful. After they were successful and before they were successful. Yes. With Robert Shaw and James Jill Jones and Jean-Pierre Pujold. I'm trying to figure out how I never knew about Swashbuckler, considering the cast. Because, wow, I'm going to have to find yeah. it and watch it. So James Earl Jones was the nicest guy in the world. And Jean-Vieux Pujol was so hot. She was great. All right. Well, okay. Now we got to go all watch uh, Swashbuckler. Exactly. And Robert Shaw was a drunk jerk. 
And at one point we were standing next to each other and he was, he was super intellectual, really smart. He wrote a bunch of plays. He wrote the man in the glass booth. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. You know, he was, he was very much into the bottle at that point. This was before the sting, Mm. but after Jaws. All right. So yes, it was after Jaws. no, but, but the, can, sting the sting was 73, four? 74. Well, then I guess maybe it was after the sting. We were down in Mexico and uh, and he's standing there in his little red pirate outfit and we're watching James Earl Jones do a thing. And suddenly he hits me in the ribs. He just goes like whap. And he takes my breath away. And I look at him and he says to me, and there's nothing you can do about it. Are you serious? I am serious. Wow. Okay. So I got custody of the story. <laughs> you got custody. So of here we story. are. And I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to say that I came back to Universal and they hired me actually Wally Worsley and some of the other guys. They hired me for a couple of months to wander around, poke my nose around and write the manual of Universal Studios. And this is this department and this is who's here and thing like that. And they took out all my jokes and all my quotes and all my cartoons and things. And they made a corporate policy for seven years. So that was a nice gig. And then they promoted me to first assistant director. And I was working on a show called Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Oh, wow. Also one of my favorites from, from uh, childhood. <laughs> bitty, bitty, bitty. This was 1979. Universal at that point was still like a college campus and everybody kind of knew each other and you'd visit each other's sets and you'd see people uh, at the commissary and you kind of, you know, there was, it was like, uh, it was like a collegial sort of organization and people started disappearing. It was like one by one people were disappearing and it's like, Oh, what happened to Fran? Oh, well, she's in Chicago. Oh, what happened to, oh, they sent them to Chicago. And what was happening is they were prepping this movie called the blues brothers there, which was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they were expanding the number of people they needed to work on it. And Sure enough, I got this call. Jeremy, you're going to Chicago. You're going to Chicago. <laughs> so I was a freshly minted first AD. I had been a first on one or two episodes of Buck Rogers. And they were quick to tell me, we don't want you to go and run the set. There's a guy, David Sosna, who's been prepping with John Landis for months. He's going to run the set. David, by the way, is to my mind, like the best in the business. This, the, the work he did on Blues Brothers is second to none. But we need help coordinating Stuntmen coming in and out, blues mobiles, this security at the mall, things like, you know, they couldn't even enumerate what they needed. We just want to send you there. So, okay, well, that's, whatever it is, it's better than Buck Rogers in the 25th century. And so I, uh, I kissed my girlfriend goodbye. I said, I'll see you in three months. A week later, I sent her a ticket. We've been together ever since 1979. That's my wife. You just <laughs> take her to all the best sets. Well, that's right. <laughs> I mean, but this is obviously before 1986. So that was yes. the first one I took yes. her to. And so we will always have Chicago as kind of a romantic, you know, this isn't necessarily what you wanted to know about. I'm loving now, this. This is awesome. This is fantastic. I will tell you one story from that. And that is, uh, there is a scene in Blues Brothers at the mall. Are you familiar with yes. the Yes. Yeah. Oh, I am familiar with Blues Can you Brothers. tell me what the first shot, the first interior shot is after the cars have been okay. racing around? All right. I guess I spoke to they soon. crash through the they wall going the into wall, the mall yeah. and they come into a toy store and so we had a toy store set in the in the mall and we put a fake wall there and the ran the, the car through and it burst through and knocked over every shelf in the thing and knocked all the toys off the shelves and you know when the dust clear everybody okay everybody's okay uh john landis pulled took picked up a kermit doll kermit the frog doll that had fallen over here and wired it to the front bumper of the blues mobile. Okay. And you can't see it. I've looked frame by frame. I've tried to see it in the thing. Um, and then we shot for a week there, complete mayhem. I don't think you could do that scene today. Certainly not the way we did it because we were all working in this interior thing, cars with exhaust, actual glass, not breakaway glass. I mean, how hazardous, how dangerous by today's standards. Back then it was like, oh yeah, we'll take one for the team. We're going to, we're going to, you know, it's going to be fine. And by the way, John Landis would later go on in 1980, in 1982 to kill three people at, at the, uh, at Indian Dunes on Twilight Zone. On Twilight Zone. And I'd be happy to come back and talk about that all day long with you. But what I will say is that if, if um, David Sosna had been the first on Twilight Zone, it would not have happened mm. that he would have had the wherewithal to say, John, 
Let's stop the shot. Let's do this properly. We'll get the shot. It'll be where you want it to be, but we're not going to do it unsafely. So I just want to do that shot out. So anyway, at the end of the week of shooting and the place was, uh, you know, trashed. Trashed. (laughs) Right. There was nothing there. I found the Kermit doll. And so I took that home and that has become our icon for Debbie and me. The uh, every location I've been on, Poland, Italy, everywhere, Kermit's come with us. The portrait of our children has them holding Kermit. And it's just like that really became a. Kind of an icon for us, our first child. That's so sweet. Wonderful. I love that story so much. Oh my gosh. (laughs) My favorite thing about Blues Brothers is is its sweetness. Like it's it's got a lot of heart for a movie that's about You know, it's about the music. It's It's about about the the music. music. You know. And I tell you, Cab Calloway, I was I was just I met him. I was just could not have been more knocked out. That is fantastic. More than Aretha Franklin, more than anything. Now, I only did the Chicago portion. They came back and did an awful lot of it here, uh, which I was not on on payroll for, unfortunately. But I had a great time. We had three months there. It was fantastic. It has a lot of that recklessness, revolutionary, like rawness of the 70s movies and television. And yet it also is the beginning of, okay, really, let's just do a, you know, 25 minute car chase and and crash things well uh, you know i guess uh, what they had in the 70s for a brief shining moment is when they were letting auteurs do studio movies yes. they were letting right is that the 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 streams crossed and you had the chinatown and you had the uh godfather, godfather you had right yeah. and there um uh, harold and maude and you know that that kind of group of things and then it just became clear that that's not the movie that studios that's not the business studios wanted to be in well and again it was also uh jaws and star wars that turned into everything into a blockbuster right like like suddenly that's the that's the business we want to be in and i love both those movies but in some ways their success marked the beginning of a blockbuster era that has never ever ever left us i'm going to tell you my jaws story even though it's completely off the track Okay. I, yes, you, you've heard it, I think, but this is just. But our viewers haven't. <laughs> All those viewers out there. Okay, let me paint you a picture. That in 1974, we'd all been, uh, I was in the mailroom at, at Universal, and we were aware that there was this movie that they were shooting that was really in trouble. Uh, and it was Jaws. And there were a number of reasons that it was not shut down that are not particularly well known. One is that Marsh Green, who is the film executive uh his brother hilton green was the tv executive they had both grown up as part of the universal family their dad had been doug green had been mary pickford's director right they came by it honestly so anyway marsh was out with a heart attack and john oser who's the head of the budget department was also out for health reasons for a particular amount of time so it's they were not my perspectives they were not getting the information uh, amalgamated correctly to shut down the movie, they would absolutely have shut down. So anyway, so Jaws is going on. We're aware that there have been issues with it, but, you know, it's also, there's the big shark. At one point, we'd actually snuck out from the mailroom to see where the shark was being built, and we'd seen Bruce. And you know where he is now, right? Mm-hmm. He's right? in. He's at Universal. On the tram tour. Isn't that him? No, he is. Uh, you know something? There might be more than one Bruce, okay. but I'm under the impression that the real Bruce, the shark, is hanging in the Academy Museum. Oh, Really? When you go up to the the top floor, yeah. he is he is there in space there for you. So anyway, the movie is getting ready to open, and it's about a month before the movie opens. And I can't remember if they've had the Dallas screening where they got the idea, oh, yes, this might be a successful movie. But there's going to be a screening this Wednesday coming up. And I go to my friend Stan Musgrove, because, you know, I've been schmoozing him for a year in the mailroom. And I say, can I get into this screening? Can you Can you help me get into the screening on Wednesday? He said, okay. I came back the next day. Okay, here's what you do. The screening's at 8 o'clock. At a quarter to 8, you stand outside the main gate. A white limo will pull up. The back door will open. You get in, and you can go as Mae West's guest. Hold on. We're sitting up. Go. For your listeners, Mae West (laughs) was the first Madonna. I don't know. Even Madonna is probably dated now. Who would uh, The Lady Gaga. Before there was Lady Gaga, there was 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 Mae West. And then before there was Madonna, there was Marilyn Monroe. And before Marilyn Monroe, there was Mae West. Mae West was a creator. She was a playwright. Mm -hmm. She was was much more than Marilyn Monroe, right? And she was arrested and she had a play on Broadway called Sex. I mean, she was really, she was the real thing. Okay. 
1974, she's 83 years old. She is still making movies. She was in a movie called Sextet that, Sextet that very year. And I, you know, I can't believe it. Yes, I will go there. That, that I'm absolutely going to do that. So there it is, quarter to eight. I'm there. The car pulls up, door opens. I get in, and there she is, right? You are going wow. to see Jaws Yes, in a white limo yes. with Mae West. The shortest ride in the world in a white limo. Because they've already arrived at the studio. Okay. That's okay. And there's two or three other guys in addition to the driver. It's not a one on one date. You know, nothing. I don't expect anything's going to happen. But you're part of her entourage. I am you're part of the entourage. En- absolutely. I am probably the worst built guy there. Okay. And so we go into the Hitchcock Theater, bloop, right? Park, get out, walk in, and I'm sitting next to her. And we're a few minutes early, right? Waiting for the lights to go down. And she's starting to tell me some stories about the 1930s, how she discovered Cary Grant, how she had a an all white apartment that she had a pet monkey and he threw his feces all over the place. Right. <laughs> and I am in hog heaven. This is the greatest thing. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the movies of the twenties yeah. and thirties. So I, I'm well aware of who she is and I am having such a great time. Then the lights come down and none of us has ever seen jaws before. Right. We don't know. Right, right. Everybody knows now that there's this poor stunt girl that goes out from the, from the party and is going to get eaten immediately. Mae West has not finished. She is still telling me the story because <laughs> once you start her at age 83, she finishes when she's ready to finish. And she has this arc. She has the whole thing down yes. to a science and no f-ing shark is going to stop her from, <laughs> from telling a story. story. So it's like, Mae West, shut up. I'm trying to watch the movie. So that really, it just made my 21 year old head explode. It was like one of the greatest <laughs> nights of all time. When you get into the limo, though, what does she say? Does she say anything to you or does anybody? Uh, you know, it's hello, I'm Jerry. Uh, you know, I don't mm-hmm. even remember. That part is not known to us. Now, my- <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the most amazing stories I've ever heard. So. There, there's so many parts of that that are amazing. That's <laughs> yes. the best part. That's right. That's right. Shut up, Bay West. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh my goodness! Okay, Man, so it's a little off topic. It is, but it's it's a great off topic. Uh, one thing about Blues Brothers, I'm going to say, yes, is my assistant, whom we found in Chicago. I interviewed a few. Uh, was a gal named Ketterly Frauenfelder. That's a name. Who was brilliant? She was so smart, and she has been Tim Burton's assistant director and executive producer for about 25 years. That is fantastic! Wow. I mean, her career is so much better than my career. <laughs> <laughs> but I was lucky, to, very lucky to have her on Blues Brothers. Oh, that's fantastic. Your career has been pretty good. Yeah, but it's not Ketterly's career. <laughs> but I do But I do have the Kerbet doll, and she does not. So well, there you go. So there. All right. So Cagney and Lacey. We got to talk about Cagney and Lacey because this is 80s TV. Ladies, after all, let's bring it back into our sweet spot. And uh, you worked on a couple episodes of Cagney and Lacey. Yeah. How yeah. was that? What was going on? I uh, it was fun. It was great. I liked the ladies. What season was it? Do you remember? Had they been around for a while? I mean... Uh, oh, yeah. They, uh, I was one of their very last seasons. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, it was... It, obviously, then it was it was Sharon Gloss playing. Yes. Yeah, Chris there were Cagney. three Cagneys. So, right. Yeah. We, we've talked about that before. We're going to get... When we get to Cagney and Lacey, we will, we will dive further into that whole three <laughs> Cagneys, which I'm very excited about. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah. So what it also looks like, and again, we haven't, you know, we haven't examined it closely, but it definitely was a show that in the eighties felt like it was trying to be a feminist show. It was clearly oh, absolutely. like here, they're, they're two ladies and they're cops, right? but they're, they're one's a single lady mm-hmm. one's a single lady, and the other's a nice married lady with a lovely husband. And don't home. worry. She still likes to have sex with him. Right. That, <laughs> it's fine. But it's, you know, again, it more than the other shows we've yet really talked about or looked at closely. This was a show that had an agenda and was also an issue show. Like it was like, you know, the, the, you know, Hill Street Blues, the hospital shows. It was all Barney Rosenzweig. He was really the, the genius behind that. And, so, and for every yeah. episode, what we would do is we would come, the director and I and production designer would sit in Barney's office in his small office, kind of crowded around. And he would take us through the script beat by beat and explain to us, exactly what the intention was that was always very useful and it was really the first show we're going to be talking about that is about the two female leads it's their stories and they're the ones that are driving story without having the counterpart who is it was a man obviously there are men in the show but the show is really about their relationship it is, they are driving the story yeah. it is their journeys to their end and and that female 
work friendship so particularly unique even now like Mm -hmm. there's not a lot that is that is focused on these are two people who work together and they create a relationship that is a friendship but also a working friendship and they didn't hang out together yeah i mean because because uh lacy went home Mm -hmm. she went to she went to her husband she and her kids and had yeah. stuff to do it. And Chris went out to wherever it was that she went to Chris, and lived right. her life as a right. single woman in New York, right. you know, so good for her. Yeah. Good for both of them. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things I, that I like about the premise in the show that it does show that balance that there isn't one way to be a feminist. It's it's a you know combination of things. All right. But that was shot in L.A. Yeah. It's set in New York, shot in L.A. That, they, they always said that was their biggest mistake. Yeah. It was not shooting it in New York because yeah. we were like fighting it. I remember this is the first time I found, I saw this particular gag. It was that our camera truck said New York Times on the front and, and New York Post on the back so we could nice. park it in the shot. <laughs> right, but it was, always, it was always guys rushing around putting license plates on to real cars and, yeah. you know, because <laughs> oh, you it. didn't have the CGI, you know, mm-hmm. you couldn't just uh, do that. Oh my God. All right. That's fantastic. I have one memory that is, has nothing to do with Cagney or Lacey, but it was just a funny thing that happened. We were shooting in the Alexandria Hotel. Downtown? Downtown. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that point, it was one of its terrible periods. It's come back. It's gone away. It's come back. It's gone. I, I don't know where it is right now. So we were shooting a scene where Cagney and Lacey come out of the elevator and they run down the corridor for something. So the camera is set up in this little landing opposite the elevator and we're ready to go. And the other elevator door opens and, you know, we all look over, you know, we're controlling the elevators. I'm, I'm, I'm in charge of, you know, okay, it's, you know, it's on hold. But unexpectedly, the, the other elevator door opens and this guy looks out and he sees the camera pointing essentially at him and as the door is closed he goes Stella (laughs) (laughs) what was great about it and of course the late episodes was that uh, we were filming at this this lot on Lacey Street as it happens there's actually there's actually a lot there right and what was great, it was so close to downtown that it was very easy to make moves to and from the studio. We could go out, do running shots, and then come back in and have lunch and shoot the rest of the day. Okay. And also what was unusual in that is we shot, I believe, seven and a half days per episode. For the, okay. We, didn't, we did not cross board. We shot seven and a half days an episode. That meant that lunch on the eighth day, we changed directors. Oh, okay. That's a little bit crazy. Wow. Well, you know, it was fine. But it was always funny to have like an extra director's chair saying director on it, hanging around for the guys that we didn't always finish exactly at lunch. Yeah, so there was a little crossover. <laughs> uh, how you doing? Oh, you're going to put the ra- camera there. It's Is rather, it's rather more directors than we're used to seeing at the time. <laughs> All right. And so more recently, you've worked on Mercy Street and Astronaut Wives Club and, you know, some t- what I would call like a 2015 TV ladies shows. Is Mercy Street something that you guys are familiar with? I was familiar with it. It's a PBS show yeah. about Civil War nurses. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. Right. It was a great show. I thought I thought that was a terrific underrated show that never found its audience and and finally what happened after two seasons the people would not work for PBS money anymore. <laughs> and so you work with the Film Commission. What what are you doing now? What, so what? I I'm helping with the uh, films that get tax credits, movies in and California. TVs in California. And part of the process of getting tax credit is you have to submit your script, your budget, um, your schedule, uh, you know, a number of different things. And I'm tasked with going through evaluating, correcting the budget, certain things qualify, certain things don't qualify. And then we throw a bunch of mathematics at it and we figure out your show is going to provide more jobs in California than your shows. It's mathematical, you know, whether it's accurate, who can say, but it started out as a lottery and it's conceived that this is more fair than a lottery. Every show that receives a tax credit also needs to give back in the sense of having and hiring an intern, uh, bringing a class of students onto the set to visit and neb around, uh, doing a teacher externship, things like that. And I, I'm in charge of that. That's the career readiness requirement. And so I put shows together with schools, you know, with whether it's uh, the Fashion Institute, whether it's John Muir High School, whether it's uh, Ghetto Film School, you know, I get them together. And we've been doing a lot of panels lately. Uh, where the director and the producer, we had people from Macbeth, the show Macbeth, oh, yeah. do a very generous panel for, I forget who it was. And uh, so we're eventually going to be uh, linking to them on our website so other people can see those and enjoy them. All right. So we have three questions that we ask all of our guests. 
So first question, what's the 80s ladies driven TV show that's most resonated with you? Think back to the 80s and... I wasn't watching TV in the 80s. I, I was shooting. I was, uh, you know, I had a time only for my career and for my family. Can you give me a hint? What, what shows were on? You know what? Because you were working with people, I'm going to give you what 80s ladies actress was fun to work with. Fair enough. On Cagney and Lacey, there was... Tyne Daly, Sharon Glass. Tyne, Tyne was my favorite. I love Tyne. Okay. Fantastic. They, yeah. And actually, and I, I became friendly with Ellen Burstyn for a while. She wasn't really an 80s lady on TV, but I did a, I did a show with her in the, uh, it would have been late 70s. And she and I became Scrabble buddies and we corresponded for a while. Oh, I really liked her. We were, cool. we were taking an airplane to Texas to do the show and I was sitting next to her. And, uh, and as we started our descent, she says, hang on, I have to help land the plane. And then we landed. She was okay. <laughs> All right. I, love I loved her. I loved her. Oh, that's that's fantastic. All right. And what are your current, uh, any current uh, television shows with ladies leading the, the pack? <sighs> TV movies? Well, there's some good ones on Game of Thrones. There's some ladies that there I are? liked on Game yes. of Thrones, which I recently caught up with. Uh, we also recently watched um, um, Treme. Oh. And do you know that one? Mm -hmm. uh, you yes. haven't seen it, but yes. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And there were a couple of wonderful ladies in that. There was a gal who ran a restaurant that uh, her travails were terribly interesting. And uh, I liked the ladies in that show a lot. Oh, and Hacks. Oh, hacks. of course. And that's wonderful. And I think both leads are good. Yeah. Although I, th I think the, the young writer's a bit of a jerk. The young writer's a little hard. Yeah. Gene Smart's amazing. Gene Smart's I've done a number of shows with Gene Smart. She was in Samantha Who. You did Samantha oh, Who? I did Samantha Who. Okay. Uh, and Melissa McCarthy was in that too. Okay. And she was fantastic. And I love, I love Christina. Samantha Who. And Christina Applegate is tops in my book. She, I love her. Um, one weird thing, I, after I got a cell phone, after I got an iPhone, uh, and I kept trying to try automatic dial, for whatever reason, the cell phone decided it would always call Christina Applegate. Calling Christina <laughs> Applegate. Oh I have to God. hang up real quick. I mean, I don't know why. You know, it just got it into its head. <laughs> they do have a mind of their own sometimes. I, I, I loved her. She was just so much fun. I was a production manager on that. I wasn't on the set, so I wasn't really connected that closely to him. And we all thought Melissa McCarthy was fantastic. It's fantastic. The great cast. Yeah. Great cast on that. that yeah, that, that was a show that really was, I think, overlooked, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, but it did. It, it feels like it ran for a while. No, I think only I, two seasons, yeah, maybe a little more. Oh, I think two seasons, okay. if that. I so, have a, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, in my mind, <laughs> it was like three seasons. That third season was amazing. <laughs> yeah, when we went to Ireland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Going to Ireland is always the best. So third question is, what's the most action hero slash television moment you've experienced in real life? Okay, so we were doing a movie called The 13th Year, a TV movie about for Disney about a kid that turns into a mer person. It was kind of it was kind of a, a metaphor for adolescence. Mm -hmm. And we were filming down in um one of those Newport beaches or or sort of places and two things happened in quick succession. One was we were on some rocks or something overlooking the bay and I walked out in front of the crew and I was holding the board in front of me to explain something. And I suddenly realized I was doing Moses right <laughs> with my tablets in front of everybody. <laughs> and then just as that happened, the location manager played a prank on me, which took me so by surprise. It made me think I was crazy. And that was, there was a ferry going by and this must've been 300 yards away. And everybody on the ferry suddenly went, hello, Jerem. <laughs> Oh my God. And it ju it's just like, it just, you know, I just, I shit. <laughs> <laughs> so those two things, those two things happened at almost the same moment. And so that was kind of weird. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> that's a good one. That's, that's a good one. Oh my God. It has been such a pleasure to have you on the show and hear all these stories. Thank you very much. I had a good time. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Right, thank you. Hey, Susan, what time is it? It's audiography time, Sharon. Woohoo! You can find out more about the Television Academy at emmys.com. That's E-M-M-Y-S dot com. They have really cool events, some of which are open to the public.
And Jerem mentioned the Directors Guild of America DGA training program. And you can find out about that program and other director development programs through the Directors Guild at dga.org. And there will be links on our website to those resources. And if you want to watch Remington Steel on streaming, breaking news, all five seasons are currently available on Amazon Prime and Apple TV. We're not sure for how long all five seasons will be streaming, so go watch them while you can. And Sharon, I'm not saying that the last three seasons are now available because of 80s TV ladies and our fans, but actually that is what I'm saying, because I'm telling you, when we started this podcast, only seasons one and two were legally available anywhere online. And now we've got them all. I think it's us and our fans. Thank you, 80s TV ladies fans. And a book I want to tell you about... Backwards and In Heels by film reporter and critic Alicia Malone. This book highlights stories of specific women in film from Alice Key Blaché to Ava DuVernay while exploring the past, present, and future of women working in film. It's really quite good, even though it's not just about TV ladies. Next time on 80s TV Ladies, the amazing, adorable, and ever-surprising 90s TV babies will be back. Sarita, Megan, and Sergio were assigned three episodes of Remington Steel to watch, so we are looking forward to hearing the thoughts of the youths. If you're a Remington Steel fan, I'm curious what three episodes you would pick to represent the show to someone who has not watched it. Let us know at 80stvladies.com. In the meantime, please follow, rate, and review on your favorite podcast player or on Apple Podcasts. We love your suggestions and questions. Keep them coming. And as always, thanks for listening. We hope 80s TV Ladies brings you joy and laughter and lots of fabulous new and old shows to watch, all of which will lead us forward toward being amazing ladies of the 21st century. 